So, uh, I can't make it today, so I decided to record your video instead. Um, this will happen anytime I have an appointment or my wife has an appointment that I have to be there for. So we don't miss out on class. Um, you're more than welcome to gather together in the classroom and watch it all together. Like, weirdos? I don't know. Um, this will be posted. Obviously, if I tell you we're here, it doesn't help you. <laughs> well, let's go. We're going to talk more about this indeterminate form from section 1.3, right? What happens when we get 0 over 0? So, 0 over 0 is an indeterminate form. So, anytime you get this in a limit, hold on, see, if I had a draw menu in the classroom, look at this, I have colors. Amazing. This is all I want in the classroom. Um, anytime a limit equals 0 over 0, you do more work. End of story. All right, you get a limit of 0 over 0, we're going to do more work. And there's several ways that we could do that. And the first one is just dividing out. Right, if I substitute, I'll get 0 minus 0, which is 0, over 0. So I get 0 over 0. And always we should, we should do that first. But I don't want to use up my space right here. So what I might do instead, since I know I need to divide out, I see a nice common factor. Right, this numerator has, actually has x squared in common. So I can factor and cancel. Remember, we have to write the limit until we actually take it. And there's no denominator anymore. This x canceled one of these. Oh yeah, I have colors now. Let's do this right. All right, so this x squared cancels this x, and now I'm just looking at the limit as x approaches 0 of x times x to 0. So sometimes 0 over 0 can equal 0, right? And that's a limit, and you can check graphically, you can check numerically to make sure your algebra is top quality. All right, that's not what I wanted. What did I want? That's what I wanted. Here we go. Now, we're super happy if this happens. If this happens, we're like, cool, we can handle it, we can deal with it, everything's good. I gotta make that spot go away. But what happens if we can't just factor? Here's another one. Alright, as x approaches 3, we'll put in our 3. So we have 3 plus 1 under the radical, minus 2, all over 3 minus 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 minus 2 over 3 minus 3 is 0 over 0. So we do more work. Always. We get 0 over 0. We've got to do something. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this function. And I'm not going to deal with the limit right now. I'm just going to find a similar function. So let me move this cursor out of the way. So I'm going to say that the limit as x approaches 3 of this function is the same as the limit as x approaches 3 of, I need to find this function. Get that little thing out of the way there. Uh, red. Red's too harsh. Let's use some blue here. So we're going to find a new function. So what we're going to do is rationalize. And it's weird because we normally rationalize the denominator, but the denominator doesn't have the radical. So what we're going to do, take our original function, and we're going to multiply by the exact right thing to make the radical in the numerator go away. And to do that, we use what's called a conjugate. All right, little aside here in purple. Uh, we know that a squared minus b squared is equal to a plus b times a minus b. And that is an a there. There we go. So we're using this idea of uh, difference of squares. Difference of squares is good, are going to give us conjugates. So these two are called conjugates of each other because the middle sign, right? They're binomials, so binomial, two terms, and the sign in the middle 
is opposite. So these are called conjugates. So we're going to multiply by the conjugate of the radical, both numerator and denominator. I'm riding uphill. I'm in a good mood today. Um, who knew sleeping in could get you in a good mood? Uh, all right, so when we multiply, square root times square root, that's just going to give us the x plus 1. Notice the square root times positive 2 and the square root times negative 2 cancel each other out, just like here. And so negative 2 times positive 2 is a minus 4. So when we multiply that numerator, when we actually get rid of the, the radical, right, the process of rationalizing, we multiply it through. But in the denominator, we're just going to hold on to this. We're not going to simplify anything in the denominator until we have to. All right, so I'm running out of room here. Let's make it work down here. We see that x plus 1 minus 4 is, oh, look at that. It's an x minus 3. That's the same x minus 3 we had in the denominator to start with. Like I didn't know that was going to happen, right? So we can, uh, let, me, let me throw a little red up here. We could always factor out a 1 and make it look like a factor if we prefer. The x minus 3's cancel out, and we're left with 1 over the square root of x plus 1 plus 2. This, this function we found after rationalizing is what we're putting up here. This is our similar function everywhere except at x equals 3, right? We just canceled out the issue at x equals 3. It's pretty clever, isn't it? Yeah, I like it. It's, it's, it's pretty slick. So now we can find this limit in order to find the limit of our original answer. As x approaches 3, we now have 1 over 3 plus 1 under the radical plus 2. 3 plus 1 is 4. Square root of 4 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. So we have found the original limit. And if you check it graphically and check it numerically, you're going to find 0.25, 1 fourth. But we did it algebraically because we used a process of rationalizing the numerator using the idea of conjugates which lead us to the difference of squares. And you can see here, if I square this first thing, right, square the square root, we get x plus 1. If we square the 2, we get a 4. So it's a difference of squares right now. We're going to use this a lot. Expect this on quizzes. Expect this on exams. Expect this on a final exam. All right, this, is, this is a very important technique, and it will come up in future calculus classes as well. All right. So let's do it again. If we... Put in a 5. 5 minus 5 is 0. 5 squared is 25. 25 minus 25 is 0. All right. So let's do some work. 5 minus x. I mean, this is a screaming difference of squares already. Uh, I have the difference of squares formula up there. Rewind if you need to catch it. This will be x minus 5. Actually, let's turn that into x plus 5. When I factor my difference of squares, I like to put the positive one first. Because I like to be a positive person in general. So, I don't know, it's just habit, it's just little things, little things in life. But, see, this x minus 5 is not the same as a 5 minus x. But, if I factor out a negative 1, I can reverse the order of subtraction. Technique here. Take out the negative 1, and it reverses the order of subtraction. So, negative 1 times x is the negative x. Negative 1 times negative 5 gives me the 5x. Or, excuse me, the 5. Hmm. What I pointed at, not what I said. Now, we can cancel our x minus 5s and get negative 1 over x plus 5. So this limit is reduced to finding the limit as x approaches 5 of 1 over x plus 5 because we canceled out the problem spot. Remember, calculus doesn't care what happens at 5. So x minus 5 is no big deal. That's just a factor. Cancel it. It cares what happens near. And near, whoop, negative matters. This is, uh, this
this is that g of x. It's a similar function. Uh, it might be called a related function. I don't remember the terminology used in your homework uh, specifically, but this is what they're looking for after you simplify it in order to, to find the limit. So now when I plug in 5, I'll have a negative 1 over 5 plus 5, which is a negative 1 tenth. Uh, and you can always check it out. Make sure I broke my pen. Make sure that what you have going on is correct. Let's see if I can fix it on the fly here. Yep, okay. Don't let it be hard, right? Let it be easy. Let it be easy and don't overthink it. We're just factoring one way or another. Factoring or unfactoring, as the case might be. All right, so this is a, this is a really good example. Uh, you'll see why in chapter two, uh, maybe chapter. Yep, you'll see why in chapter two. Uh, limit as x approaches zero. So as x goes to zero, this is zero. Square root of five minus square root of five will get a zero, and a zero in the denominator. It's an indeterminate form. So we got to do work. All right, let's see. Move that cursor a little bit more. If I do the square root of 5 plus x minus the square root of 5, I don't know, let's try rationalizing, right? Let's multiply by its conjugate. Anytime I see a radical and I'm evaluating a limit that gives me an indeterminate form, if there's a square root in there, I'm heading straight to the, let's try rationalizing. What else is there to do? Same thing, numerator and denominator. And when we multiply, we'll get a 5 plus x minus, right, so uh, the square root of 5 plus x times square root of 5, and then the opposite of that, right, so we have a negative, so they cancel out, so we'll have a minus. Square root of 5 times square root of 5 is 5. Remember, it's using that difference of squares formula uh, in purple up above, if you need to or rewind a bit. Down below, don't forget that x, that's got to stay there. Square root of 5 plus x plus the square root of 5. Uh, notice here, let's throw it down a little bit in red, let's make it smaller. The 5 and the negative 5 cancel out. So I'll have an x over x. So I'm left with a 1 in the numerator, right, that, uh, like we, if we factored out a 1, positive 1 this time, not the negative, and square root of 5 plus x plus the square root of 5. So this is the limit we're going to find. The limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of 5 plus x plus the square root of 5, that's all under 1. And my limit is 1 over, hmm, 1 over 2 square root of 5. This is our exact answer. If Web of Science does not tell you how to round, you will use the exact value, right? always. Always assume exact unless it specifically tells you how many decimal places to round to. So we're going to leave it right here and call it good because it is all right only problem with this recording is it doesn't tell me how long i've been labbing for so i'm just going to finish the lecture and hope that it fits in 50 minutes and apologize for 50 minute video okay delta x oh wait so so delta x is telling me x is not the variable, right? The whole delta x is the variable. So, got to make a point here. So, uh, okay. All right, if delta x goes to 0, so that's a 0, I'll get x squared minus x. Ah, same thing. What do I do? Well, in this numerator, right? So, let's make this here. Let's make it official. Come on. There we go. Come on. Come on.
n equals 0 over 0, so we have to do something. But there's no radical, so I go, oh, what do I do? Notice it's already set up in a difference of square style. So let's just factor. And see what happens. So we'll take this x plus delta x all squared minus x squared all over delta x. And let me see, a uh, difference of squares. So it's the first one plus the second times the first one minus the second. Right, so we have a, uh, maybe put a little, a little parenthesis here, a plus b times a minus b, right? a squared minus b squared equals a plus b times a minus b, still over delta x. So I'm looking here in this first set of parentheses, and I have 2x plus delta x, and in my second set of parentheses, uh, x minus, oh, I just have a delta x. Well, what do you know? How do you like that? The delta x's cancel out. And now I'm looking at the limit as a delta x approaches 0 of 2x plus delta x, which gives us an answer of 2x. Remember, x is not going to 0. x is just chilling. Delta x, like the formal cousin, is going to 0. Okay. As delta x goes to 0, only delta x gets replaced by 0. Excellent, excellent. Oh, was there a question? I'm just kidding. There's a lecture from home. Alright. So now we want to do the same thing, but this time... I'm a cursor. This time, we have to input a function. So here we go. I'm going to take this in pieces. Piece 1, piece 2, and then the whole fraction is piece 3. So the first thing I want to do is I want to find f of x plus delta x. I know that the form of f of x is 3 times something squared plus 1. I call this the skeleton. The skeleton kind of lays the outline for, for what the structure of the function is. I just take that x and I open it up into parentheses so that I can substitute uh, what x has become. x plus delta x. Now, unfortunately, totally unfortunately, we really need to simplify this. So this will be 3 times x squared plus 2x delta x plus delta x squared plus 1. I'm going to distribute my 3. I can't talk when I do this because I might screw up. There we go. All right. Yeah, that was intense, eh? Okay. Um, if you're not in my class and you're watching this, yeah, I'm kind of like this in class too. Uh, part two. Part two, now I'm going to take this f of x plus delta x, and I'm going to subtract the original function. So I'm going to take 3x squared plus 6x delta x plus 3 delta x squared plus 1, and subtract 3x squared plus 1. So I have to distribute that negative sign. I don't want to write all of this again, but I'm going to for you. If I don't, there will be a question, and I won't be able to hear it because it's a recording. All right. I got a lot of sleep last night, so I'm kind of in a mood, I guess. A good mood. 3x squared. 1. Notice that this step, all I have left, let's put down an equal sign here. All I have left 
has a delta x in it. So that's the that's that's what we get from subtraction. Everything has a delta x in it. When you do this, if you do not have a delta x left over, you did something wrong. Right? If, if you don't have a delta x in each term, not left over, if you don't have a delta x in each term at this step, you've done something wrong up here. So check your work. Because in step three, we will now put it all together. Eh, let's not. Let's take f of x plus delta x minus f of x all divided by delta x and we can see that that will be 6x delta x plus 3 delta x squared all over delta x this delta x I'm going to factor it out if I take a delta x out of the numerator, I'm left with a 6x and a 3 delta x. Because I had squared, I just lose one of them. Ah, oh, so much work. Those delta x's cancel out. And I'm left with 6x plus 3 delta x. Now, I forgot to tell you about step 4. Step 4 is where we actually find the limit. And that, I think I could fit in here, the limit as delta x approaches 0 of 6x plus 3 delta x is, you see, 6x plus 3 times 0, which is 6x. Whoo, that was a lot of work. Oh, um, but that's all right. That's that's all right. We actually did the exact same work in the previous example. It just we didn't have to replace our f of x. All of these steps were finished for us. Uh, we got it at this stage, kind of, all right, without simplification really. All right. So you could totally do this. You could do this. It's just factoring. It's just algebra, right? And you're good at algebra. Because why wouldn't you be good at algebra? You're my student. <coughs> so if that was a rough edit, it's because I'm recording and I have to take a snack break. I'm back now. I'm sure I have breakfast first. Okay, let's talk about the squeeze theorem. So if we have two functions, h and g, which trap f, right? So literally, as this picture shows, I don't need to use my hand. Um, f is in between h and g. So maybe you have a, an x squared here and you have a negative x squared here and they're trapping some function in between. If both h and g have a limit of l as x approaches c and f is trapped in between them, then f has that limit as well. All right? So the like two functions kind of come together. For the camera, there we go. If two functions kind of come together and trap in another function, they all have to have the same limit. If these two have the same limit, that third one does. Totally makes sense, right? It's like uh, you made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? And it's trapped in between two little, two pieces, of, not two loaves of bread. Oh my goodness. Two pieces of bread. Well, when you bring the bread to your uh, mouth, the peanut butter and jelly come too, right? It's a squeeze theorem. Also called the sandwich theorem, as it turns out. Um, for obvious reasons. So we have these two special trig limits. These ones you will want to memorize. Uh, I don't want you memorizing red though. Just memorizing purple. Know these limits. Throw them down on a note card. Look at them. Have them handy. Always. Sine of x over x as x goes to 0 will be 1. Uh, notice we can't factor and cancel. Uh, sine of 0 is 0, x being 0. It's total squeeze theorem idea here. And the same idea with the uh, shift on the cosine. So what we might do in a situation like this, um, I want to approach it the easy way. Remember that whole constant multiple idea? Uh, I'm still using purple. 
what I could do is that one fifth, that five in the denominator, that's just a, that's just a coefficient. That's all it is. Or a scalar multiple. That's it, right? And I know that this limit is one. And I'm really wondering if it's, it's truly that easy. I, I'm a little scared that maybe I screwed that up. Because how could it possibly be that easy? But that's all it is. Right? That's all it is. This 3, this coefficient, that's a scalar. And we could always move the scale factor past the limit. We know that the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine of x over x is 0. And we get 0. And it's hard for me to believe that our time has ended. But alas, it has. <laughs> oh, maybe I didn't get enough sleep. I'm doing, I'm doing some goofy stuff here. So don't freak out about these limits, right? Indeterminate form, it's just saying, hey, calculus actually has some stuff in it. And that stuff is algebra. Whole bunch of algebra. So that's it for today. Look at that. 25 minutes. It's amazing what a lecture can be when uh, students aren't asking questions. So we're going to have two days on 1.4. Um, I'm going to start tomorrow, Wednesday, January 26th, with uh, questions over 1.3. So we'll start here since we didn't get a chance to talk about them in class. Uh, that's it. Have a great day. I will talk to you on Wednesday.